Get ready for it because next Sunday is ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. So I want to see you all decked out in your ugliest Christmas sweaters. You know what? If you don't have an ugly Christmas sweater, just take some ugly clothing out of your closet and write Merry Christmas on it. And we will declare it an ugly Christmas sweater, okay? You know, it's, a, a, it's Friday night's concert. For those of you who were there, it was phenomenal. I mean, we had hundreds of people there. People were stopping along the way watching. You know, the kids, the kids were up front in the stage just dancing, having a great time. One of them lost their shoe. And uh, so I've been like the prince in Cinderella going to all the kids going, is this your shoe? So if your kid lost the shoe, I have it, okay? So come, come and get your shoe up here. But it was just a, a fantastic evening on Friday night. You know, I am excited about Christmas. I am excited about this season, the celebration, everything that takes place during this time of year. And, um, you know, it's hard to believe we're less than two weeks away. I mean, do you believe that? Christmas is right around the corner. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that in your life, your lights are up. Everybody got your lights up? Yeah. You know, you're able to detangle them. You're able to plug them in and they actually light up. I, I don't know about you, but... I get frustrated. Every time I plug those lights in, I, they worked last year. I put them in a box, I pulled them out, and now they don't work. I just saw a newspaper report that said 95% of your lights can be fixed if you have the patience for it. I don't have the patience for it. If I plug it in, I spend about two minutes. If it doesn't work, I throw it away and go out and buy a new one. But I have no, no patience for it whatsoever. I mean, hopefully your Christmas tree is up and decorated. Yeah, I've got an orange cat in my house that I'm constantly redecorating my tree because of that orange cat. But Christmas is loading, isn't it? And if you're not ready, you better shake a leg because, like I said, it's only two weeks away. The malls are packed. I mean, there's time to do your shopping, but it's, it's shoulder to shoulder. The Christmas music is blaring. I mean, there's been some fights at Walmart already. I mean, you can tell we are in the throes of Christmas. Out in the parking lot, there's an awful lot of praying going on as, as people are looking for a parking spot. <laughs> you know, but as I was reminiscing about Christmas, I, I was uh, reminiscing about family traditions. You know, and for me this year, my family traditions are changing. You know, both of my girls are older. You know, they've both gone off to work, and, and they both work during the Christmas celebration. And, and so maybe you've experienced some change as well in your life. You know, every year, me and my family, we go up to my mom, who lives in the villages, and we don our finest Christmas clothing, and we go down to the squares to party with the grandmas and the grandpas. But, like, even this year, it's going to be different, because my family members are not all going to be with me this upcoming year. I, I was also thinking about some of the other family or some of the other traditions that, that my wife and I have participated in, in in the last 30 years or so. I remember when we first got married, when we were young parents, Okay, we, we would go to Christmas Eve service, so we'd always come together and we'd worship at Christmas. I'm a pastor, so of course I'm here at Christmas Eve. You know, and back in the day, we used to have an 11 p.m. service. And so I wouldn't even get home from church until 12.30, quarter to one. And then, at that point, we decided to wrap all the Christmas gifts. I mean, have you ever been there? It's 3 a.m. in the morning. You can't even see straight, and there you are wrapping Christmas gifts. It was always that time as well that I decided to, to put together my kids' gifts. You know, I'm trying to build a bicycle at 3 a.m., and, and things are just not going right, and, and I begin to cop an attitude out there. And all of a sudden, at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve, I have a Christmas attitude brewing. You know, when you look at, it, at the presents in our house, you know, it's amazing, because when my wife wraps a present, I mean, it looks like it's a professional job. When I wrap a present, it looks something like this, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and when I was a kid, when I was a kid, Christmas Eve always seemed to be the longest night of the year. Okay, just a little trivia for you. This upcoming year, it's actually December 21st, is the longest night of the year. It's the winter solstice. But as a kid, Christmas Eve just always seemed to be the longest night of the year. And, and I got to admit, even today, for me, even today, it's, it seems to be like a long night. I, I'm always waking up and going, is it time? Is it time? When I was a kid, I would sneak downstairs in the middle of the night, and I would look down, and I'd see the Christmas tree with the presents, and I would run upstairs, and I would try to wake my mom and dad up and say, is it time, is it time? And it'd be like 2 o'clock in the morning. They just went to bed. It's like, no, it's not time. Go back to bed. You know, and it wasn't until about 6 a.m. that they would actually get out of bed, and we would celebrate Christmas. To this day, I do the same thing. I'm constantly looking at my watch. Is it time? 
at 6 a.m. or thereabouts, <laughs> I will go and I will wake my wife up. I will wake my, my daughters up, 24 and 23 years of age, and say, it's time, it's time, it's Christmas time. Everybody get up, get up, get up. Because I think Christmas is magical. I mean, I just, I love watching my kids open gifts. I mean, especially when they were younger. I mean, remember the excitement? You know, the anticipation of, of everything that was going on. You know, when my kids were younger and all those toy commercials would come on, they would, all of a sudden, they would want that toy. And they, would want, they wanted every commercial toy that was out there. You know, and so when, when Christmas morning came, there was this mystery to it. Because they weren't really sure what it was that they were going to get. And so I just love watching the expression on their faces. You know, in my house, we have a very strict don't shake it rule. Okay, because my wife, you know, if, if she could shake a gift, she'll know exactly what it is. And it just aggravated the daylights out of me. So even to this day, you know, like I'll put a bottle of water in the present as well, or I'll, I'll put a weight in it, just so if she does shake it without me, without me knowing it, okay, I, I, you know, I try to throw her off the scent a little bit. And, and I've got to admit, over the years, when it comes to gift giving, especially to my children, at times I go over the top. You know, I have a tendency to give too many gifts at times. You know, because once again, I'm excited. I'm excited to give my kids, my family, good gifts. I get excited to watch their, their excitement when they open up those good gifts. You know, I remember one Christmas, um, I sat down, I started to open up my gifts, and, and the very first gift I opened up was one of those wax toilet bowl rings. <laughs> and then the next gift was a faucet for the sink. The next gift was a tree trimmer. Okay, basically, my, it was the worst Christmas ever. My wife gave me, my wife gave me a honeydew list for Christmas. And that was my entire gift. But have you ever noticed your kids, you know, when, when they're younger, they want all these little toys. But when they get older, they get fewer toys, but those toys become more expensive. You know, once again, I, I love the excitement of Christmas. But as a dad, it's my excitement. You know, I love my excitement of, of giving my kids gifts. And then when they're opening a gift, and I know it's a gift that they want. Oh, I, the anticipation because I know what's coming. I know what's under that wrapper. And so when they finally open it up, man, it is exciting because I'm giving them a gift not only that they need, but even gifts that they want. My, my oldest daughter, Sydney, just kind of reminiscing, my oldest daughter, Sydney, once, her number one gift was a razor ripstick. Remember these things? A razor ripstick is basically a skateboard with only two wheels. Okay, it was this aluminum skateboard, you stepped on it, and you'd shake your, like, your back leg, and it would begin to do one of these numbers, and it'd build up momentum and go. Now, when she first got that razor ripstick, I mean, she was outside Christmas morning, and she was playing on it. We made her wear a helmet. She had the wrist guards, the elbow, the knee. I mean, she was in full body armor, right? Because if she went down, we didn't want her to get hurt. But, I mean, she quickly got it, you know, and she was all over the place in the neighborhood in that ripstick, and, and finally, all the body armor except for the helmet came off. Well... Later that week, she got sick. She came down with the flu, and she was feeling weak, and she was bedridden for a couple of days. Well, the very first day that she was feeling better, she decided to go outside. She still doesn't have all of her coordination. She still does not have all of her strength. And she decides she's going to ride this ripstick down the street. Well, it was a beautiful day, and I went on a bike ride. And I am coming home on my bike ride, and I see my daughter laying in the middle of the intersection of our neighborhood. I roll up on her, it's like, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Get out of the street. Don't be laying there. You know, and she, she very casually, nonchalantly says, Dad, I think I broke my leg. And I said, you didn't break your leg. Get out of the street. And she's like, no, I think I broke my leg. So I rode my bike home, and I set my bike down in the grass, and I very nonchalantly walked over to her, and I'm like looking at her going, yeah, she broke her leg. <laughs> so, so I pulled her out of, you know, I took her to the hospital. I met my deductible by January 4th that year. I had needless tests all year long. I, I mean, I was tested for everything. It was a good year medical treatment-wise. But you know what? I love to give gifts. I love to give my, kid, my kids gifts, which reminds me of Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 11, which Jesus says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? I mean, Jesus is saying, which of you parents... If your kids are asking you for a fish or for an egg, if your kids are asking you for something good, which of you parents are going to give them something that's evil? 
Which one of you parents is going to give something to them that, that's, that's harmful or that bad? Okay, none of us. And Jesus says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so what Jesus is saying is, is if we who are evil, if we who are sinful, if we who are self-centered, and we know how to give good gifts to our kids, and we want to bestow good gifts upon them, if we who are evil can do it, just think about your Father in heaven, who is everything, who is perfect, who is good. I mean, think about the gifts that he wants to bestow upon us. And so as we enter this Christmas season, my friends, there's got to be something to this gift of Jesus, right? And, and that's what I want to delve into this morning, and I want to do it from the book of Ephesians. This is Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, beginning in the first chapter at the third verse. And Paul starts off by saying this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, right off the bat, you can hear the excitement in Paul's voice. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, praise God for the whole work of God for our salvation. Praise God for everything that he's given, everything that he has done for us. That Greek word praise, it means to sing out to lift up your voice, to celebrate, to, to, to make much of something. And so right off the bat, Paul is, is singing out. He's making much of, of God the Father, of this work. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, if you're one of those that you like to mark up your Bible, you know, you circle things, you underline things, and make notes in the in the index? Well, this would be, every time you see that term, in Christ, I would encourage you to go ahead and circle it, to mark it, to, to take in, to unpack everything that you see right there. Paul actually uses it 168 times in his writing. I mean, this is powerful because it's when we are in Christ that we, we receive every spiritual blessing. When we are in Christ, we receive justification. In other words, we've been declared innocent. You've been acquitted of all your sins. In Christ, we receive sanctification. In other words, God's Spirit's at work in us, working in us to become more and more Christ-like in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. We receive forgiveness. We receive joy and peace and hope and the assurance that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every good transaction that God has with his, with his creation, with us, is in and through Christ. I mean, there's an awful lot to unpack there in that, that one little term, in Christ. Because in Christ, all good things come to us. And then, then Paul, he begins to unpack at this a little bit. Well, what are some of these spiritual blessings that you and I receive in Christ? He goes on to say, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Okay, so there's that in him again, right? So God chose us in him. Who's at work? It's not us. This is all God. God chose us. God is seeking us out. He chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. I mean, this is amazing if you think about it. Look at the goodness of God. Before the creation of the world, he was already laying out our salvation. Before the creation of the world, he was already at work calling us to himself. And he called us to be holy and blameless. Paul goes on to write in Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, but now you have been reconciled by Christ's physical body through death to be made holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. We've been made holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. Let, let me try to explain this to you. We know we sin. Okay, a sin is anything that we think, say, or do that goes against the will of God. I mean, all you need but do is think for a moment, and you realize how quickly, how often we fall short of God's glory. And we know that the wages of sin, what we deserve, what we earn because of our sin is death. Not only physical death, what we deserve is, is spiritual death. What we deserve is hell. We deserve to be separated from God for all of eternity. But in Christ, we have been made holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. See, what Christ did for us is, he, is, is all of our guilt, all of the sins that you and I have ever committed, 
are credited to Jesus. They're, they're put on Jesus when he's on the cross. He paid the debt, the sin debt, that you and I could never, ever pay. We could never be good enough. We could never do enough good. He took all of our sin upon himself. He paid the debt, and then Christ's righteousness is credited to us. In other words, we are clothed with his righteousness. That when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but he sees the holiness, the perfectness, the righteousness of Jesus in what he's done for us. Paul goes on to say, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. You know, when I read that, I, I can hear the excitement, or I, I can feel the excitement that God is is experiencing. Just like my excitement on Christmas morning, when I give my kids a gift and they're opening it and I know what's coming and so I'm excited, I mean, I, I think God is doing the same thing with us. God is excited about you. God is excited about the gift that he is giving to each and every one of us. Before the creation of the world, God is calling us. God's excited about this, this gift I mean, in fact, it goes on to say, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We're God's children. You know, once again, as a dad, man, I, I can remember my kids. I, as clear as day, okay, I can remember my kids being born. 24, 23 years ago. As clear as day, I can picture it. Man, and when they were born, I was excited. I mean, it was a life-changing moment, wasn't it? But man, oh man, I was so excited. And I was excited to see them grow. I was excited to see them, see them develop and become young women. I think God feels the same excitement about us. When we were born again, when, when we received God's forgiveness, we were justified and declared innocent. He's excited to watch us grow in our sanctification, in our holiness, in our love, in our relationship with him. And just as I get excited about watching my kids, my friends, God's excited about you. You know, but as I sat back and I watched my kids at times, I mean, they kind of surprised me at times, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Stop kissing the pig, you know I mean? It's like, but, but I sit back and I think, you cannot surprise God. You know, with some of the silly, some of the stupid things we do at times, we cannot surprise God. And I want you to hear this. God has no regrets about purchasing you. God has absolutely no regrets about calling you to be his children, his son, his daughter. You could be struggling with some sin in your life. You could come all busted up. But God has absolutely, positively no regrets. We can't say the same, can we? I mean, God's got no buyer's remorse. It was not with gold and silver, but with his holy, precious blood, with his innocent suffering and death that he purchased us. We are his because he gave his life for us. And he's got no buyer's remorse. I mean, can you think back of some of the worst Christmas gifts you ever had. Remember the Ronco pocket fisherman? I mean, just go ahead and tell me. If I went fishing with this, if I happened to catch a fish, I mean, tell me that thing wouldn't snap in two and there'd be like no, you know? I mean, sit back and think of some of the worst gifts you have ever received. I, I, I sit back and I thought of this gift. Now, this came from one of my wife's family members, okay? It's, it's from this side of the family. But, but years ago, we received a potato cooker. It was two electrodes that you stuck into a potato you plugged it in, and 45 minutes later, you have a baked potato. We had microwaves at this time, and yet I got this, this potato cooker. Or maybe, maybe you know, you, you saw something on television, and you purchased it, like that 3D pancake maker, and it just didn't work the way that you wanted it to work. You know, and oftentimes, we can get disappointed when we receive a gift, but oftentimes, we're disappointed when we purchase something, and it doesn't work out the way that we wanted it to work out. My friends, when God purchased you, he knew exactly what he was buying in you. He knew the good, the bad, the ugly. He knew your shortcomings and your struggles, and yet he gave his all for you. See, that's good news. That's excellent news. That's why we're celebrating this time of year. And why did God do it? 
I mean, why would God do all of this for us? Paul goes on to write, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. To the praise, to the excitement, to the singing out, to the celebration, to the making much of his glorious grace. Not our grace, not my strength, not my effort, but God's strength and God's effort. It's all God's glorious grace. We are forgiven, we are restored by his glorious grace. And my friends, that is good news. Because at times, we bite the dust. Just like my daughter did. And at times, we break things, not only ourselves, but we break relationships, we break other things as well. And that relationships that were broken because of sin, God restores our relationship with him. God makes whole. In him, Paul goes on to say, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I love that word lavished. Because that word lavished in the Greek, it means to over the top. Okay, I mean, it's like this abound, overflowing. It's complete. This grace that God lavishes on us, this, this love that he lavishes on us, just it's overflowing, it's abounding. There's no more that could be given. That's why Paul boldly proclaims in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There it is again. There is no condemnation. My friends, what that means is your past. Whatever you've done in the past, it's forgiven. Whatever you're struggling with right now is forgiven. And the sin that you will commit in the future, it is all forgiven. It's been done. It's been paid for. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For God, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that we cannot boast. Once again, it's God doing it for us. Grace is God's undeserved, unearned, unmerited, unearnable love and favor. It's God giving us not what we deserve, but what we need. And my friends, you have been forgiven fully and freely. All of your sin has been forgiven. And not only forgiven, it's free. I mean, that's great, isn't it? Because I don't know about you, but it's like, I always want to do something. It's free. What's the catch? There is no catch. If, uh, the author of Hebrews says it like this. So Christ was sacrificed, sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. In this season of Advent, we are preparing for the Christ, right? We're excited that Christ came into the world, that Almighty God became incarnate, became one of us. And now we're excited about what's coming about his return, when he will not bear sin, but he'll bring salvation to those who await him. Now, straight up, I know some of you are struggling with this. Okay, I know some of you say, yeah, but Pastor, you don't know. Pastor, I'm way too far gone. You don't know what I did or what I said. And you know what? You could be cuddling guilt from 30, 40 years ago, and you cuddle it like a little teddy bear with with fangs. You know, you just kind of snuggle up with it, but one day it's going to bite. One day it's going to get you. And so what do we do? My friends, trust God's character. Trust God's character. It was John who said it like this. If we confess our sins, our shortcomings, our mess-ups, our screw-ups, our failures, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The God who loves you, the God who says, I will be with you always, we simply trust his character and receive God's gift of forgiveness and grace. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Three powerful letters. All unrighteousness. See, whoever believes in him is not condemned. In other words, we've been declared innocent. We've been acquitted. My friends, God's purpose for us this morning, God's message for you, is to clearly say that the sin debt in our lives has been paid in full. Martin Luther said it like this, when I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. 
But when I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. Remember Abraham? The father of many nations, he, he worshipped idols. He was a liar. He sold out his wife several times. Remember Moses? Moses was a murderer. He was on the run, and when God called Moses, Moses uh, stuttered and said, God, I'm not going. I, I can't go, God. And God used Moses to free his people from Egypt. There was a man by, by the name of John Mark, an evangelist who traveled with Paul. Mark had a bumping of heads in relationships, and, and in fear he ran away, and yet God used him to write the Gospel of Mark. There was a man named Saul who was a murderer. His whole sole purpose was to wipe the name of Jesus off the face of the earth. He was putting Christians, entire families, in prison, and he was having people executed. And yet when God called him, we know him as Paul, the great missionary who, who went around the Mediterranean basin planting churches. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. My friends, whatever you call yourself, whatever people point their finger at you and identify you as and call you, Jesus says, no, no longer, no more. You are who Jesus says you are. My friends, because of his grace, you are spiritually alive, heavenly positioned, connected to God. You're an honored child. You are his son, his daughter, loved and forgiven. It's the greatest gift of all. Let's share it. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we come before you this morning and we praise you for your gift. We praise you for your love, for your grace. That, Lord, even though we crash and burn over and over and over again, yet in your love, in your faithfulness, because of who you are, your character, you continually seek us out, you restore us. You restore that relationship between us and you. And because of what you have given and done for us, not because of what we've done, but all because of what you have done, we have the hope and the assurance of everlasting life. And so, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit at work in and through each and every one of us, may we live for you. Lord, may we give you the glorious praise of your grace. May we always point to you and your great love and your faithfulness for each and every one of us. Lord, use us. Use our gifts, our talents, our abilities to build up your kingdom, to share that greatest gift of all, the gift of your love. Father, these and all things you'd have us ask of you, we pray together in a prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory.